The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. All right. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome back to uh, DIS One. Today we're going to be talking about uh, a few more models of how humans interact with technology. Um, you can find about more uh, can can find more about those models in the the book um, that you've been hopefully uh, reading the design of um, everyday things. Uh, today, we're going to talk about conceptual models, mappings, and constraints, and the seven stages of action model. Especially, I think um, the idea of mappings will be something that you will see a lot when you think about user interfaces and how they relate to what's going on in the real world. So that will have a very universal um, appeal, hopefully. Um, before we do, um, a quick um, check here. Uh, we did talk about Gestalt laws um, and had a few sample laws that we uh, looked at, um, such as good shape, proximity, closure, common region, um, similarity, continuity, um, experience, and um, common fate. I think those were the ones that we covered. Um, and these are essentially there to tell to tell us how people cluster what they are seeing around them, how they perceive things as belonging together as groups. Um, remember, those laws will be in place all the time. Uh, they they they're being followed. This is how perception works, whether you like it or not. Um, you can use them, however, for your own to your own advantage, basically by designing your interface so that people are clustering the right things as belonging together. Um, so related buttons that have related functions, you know, you apply those various lo uh, laws in the simplest possible case to make sure that they're perceived as a group. Whereas if you have something that needs to stand out, that needs to be different, then you can also look at these laws and um, use them to understand how you would have to design something like that. So that is not perceived as a group. Um, the next thing we were looking at was how we compute information content in user interfaces. Um, and in, in this, if you recall, uh, we took a look at an inter interesting way to interpret this information content as bits um, that uh, we see basically the channel between the user and the, uh, and, and the technology, the computer or whatever it is. Um, as an information channel, channel in the in the Shannon, Shannon sense of the way, um, and we found that we can actually calculate easily with with digital representations like a digit, for example, you know, ten digits. It's clear how much information content is in there. Just you know, log two of ten basically, and that's your information content in bit in bits. Um, and we also found that we can do this with um, analog measurements as well, um, as Ali explained. Uh, you can take an analog scale and, and see how good people are at reliably associating a number of different values to a marking that they see on the scale. And um, so these, these are unmarked scales, otherwise it's, it's, it's a different story, but on an unmarked scale, people will be able to reliably tell apart a number of different positions just by looking at it. Easily, you know, with obviously two or three positions you can easily tell apart on a scale. Um, but if you have like a hundred on a mark scale, you won't be able to tell them apart reliably. And this is how we measure the information content of these analog um, interfaces. Um, and then we also took a brief look at other um, modalities like, um, you know, for example, listening to audio of different pitches, which is something that has much less information content that you can transfer reliably simply because people are not able to reliably tell apart different audio levels um, that they've heard at one point. Uh, they won't be, um, you know, unless you have perfect uh, pitch and um, then you can't reliably tell, okay, this was a C sharp, um, you know, in the third octave or something. And then remember, we took a look at this cute little Swedish hairdryer, right? Um, and, uh, what I'd like you to take away from this example is that the concept of visibility 
is a very fundamental one in interaction design. We will tease this apart more in, in upcoming classes, but overall visibility of knowing, um, you know, what an item, um, what its current state is, what the actions are that I can do with it, and how I do those actions. Um, those are the three things that people usually wonder about when they look at an ob object that they're supposed to interact with. Um, and the Swedish header, I didn't do too well um, on all those three examples. All right, so on today to, first of all, a, a very fundamental um, model that explains to us what happens when we design an interface that somebody else then interacts with. Because what's happening there is you're sort of, um, you're taking a snapshot sort of of what you, how you think about the UI um, and you move that into the interface by building it and then the user interacts with it and they build their own understanding of it. And hopefully those are the same, right? Then you did a good job. So this is what conceptual models are about. Um, to start with thinking about this, uh, this idea of conceptual models, let's make ourselves aware of the fact that we are surrounded by tons of things. Uh, one count says that over the course of a typical day in your life, you interact with like 20,000 everyday things from, you know, the water faucet you turn on in the morning to brush your teeth to the door you walk through to the, you know, the, 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 the bus that you get onto uh, figuring out which line, you know, not to jump on the wrong bus, um, to the computer that you open up and start applications. So there's tons and tons and tons of things. Um, not all of them are, you know, highly technical. Some are very simple mechanical devices, but we interact with them um, every day. And so the question is, um, how do we manage that? You, know, you don't have a huge user manual for you know, how to turn on the water in your bathroom, right? Hopefully, right? your faucet. Um, how do we do this? Well, what's going on is whenever you see a new object for the first time, your mind starts doing uh, a pretty amazing thing. It, it is building immediately. Um, it starts to build a conceptual model. And what we mean by this is... Um, it's a model of how you think this thing works. So take those scissors at the bottom there, for example. Uh, when you first see those scissors, um, even if nobody tells you how to handle them, you're starting to make a model of, well, I think, you know, I can probably put my fingers through these loops there, and I can pro probably put more than one through the bottom loop and only one through the top loop. So you will not pick this up the other way around because of the way that those two loops are formed. And um, you'll also think, okay, and if I move that, then you know those scissors are gonna move back and forth, right? So um, this is trivial, but, but if you've ever picked up uh, one of those um, you know, pincers, there are some pincers, some tweezers, that actually work the opposite way. You sometimes use those in like electronics or smaller ports work, which as you press them, they don't, they don't close, but they actually open because their normal position is being closed. So you can hold something without having to, you know, exert pressure all the time. So you pick something up you to, you, by pressing them, picking the object and letting go, and then they snap onto the object. And those are uh, very confusing when you first pick them up. So because, because they break the assumption that we've built in our head of how tweezers and, and, and scissors and all these kinds of things work, you know, closing the back closes the front. Now, these conceptual models um, are developed in our minds without us really consciously thinking about it. We don't spend a lot of effort on, on doing this. This is just something that's, go that's going on automatically um, because the mind is, is geared to make sense of what's around us. But the designer can support this, this conceptual model building by putting good affordances onto an object. And similar to the uh, Gestalt laws, affordances will always be at work, right? They can be, as we saw last time, they can be designed well, 
And in this case, you know, they can communicate the intended actions that the designer wants us to uh, understand about the object, or they can be unintentional um, and they can even be false. Right? So these affordances and the signifiers um, as an extension of the affordances model are an important part that you can use as a designer to make sure that the conceptual model that a user develops is the right one. So in a way, you, what you could think about is here is if you, as, as you're designing an interface and whether it's, you know, this digital watch that we're seeing there or, or, or these scissors, um, the, the design you do will lead to the user building a certain conceptual model in their head. And the channel on which you are communicating to the user is not a direct one. You're not standing next to that person using that object and telling them what to do. You're communicating to them through the artifact, through the object, you know, like through those scissors or the, or the watch, the interface of that watch to be more precise, right? The user doesn't care. And this will be something, by the way, that will come back to us again and again. The user usually won't care about how the internal structure of an interactive system works. Like they're not interested in, you know, the transistors and circuits and, and microcontroller programming that's behind this watch face. For them, the watch is essentially the interface, right? Um, so they are interested in that. And that's what the system image describes. The system image is this understanding this, this what, the, what, the, what the system conveys to the user and what the user starts building in their head as a conceptual model of how that thing works. So in short, the designer creates a system image, which is the user interface of a device. That system image then will lead to the user developing a conceptual model of how that thing works internally and how to use it. So we want to provide a, a good conceptual model, right? We want to provide one, that's the principle of good design, uh, that allows the user to predict what actions you know what, what the cause, what, what the effects of actions will be, or if they run into trouble with an uh, with a device or, or a technology or a system or a software or an app, um, they should know and and develop a model that helps them recover from errors. Right. So a um, you know a keyboard that has a backspace button. Um, or, or delete button, you know, will suggest, okay, this is how I can maybe correct mistakes that I've made earlier. Um, and so conceptual models are mental models of, of things around us. And, and there are other mental models, right? So, so you as a, as a human, you're building, con you're building mental models of everything. You have a mental model of yourself as a person. Um, uh, you have a, a mental model of, of other people. You have a mental model of your entire environment. Um, and conceptual models are a special kind of mental model um, that is a mental model of a thing that you are about to interact with or that you're interacting with. And as I said, they mostly form through experience, right? Most of these conceptual models just emerge by us, you know, picking up something and using it a couple of times. Um, and then, you know, we say, okay, so that's obviously how that works. But if it's something um, non-trivial, uh, we might need some training or instruction right, to learn this. We might have to learn this by ourselves, um, or you know, you might have an actual formal or informal instruction about how something works, and that will help you build your conceptual model. So the steering wheel in a car, you know, as you get on to, uh, into a car for a first time, if you've never driven around before, um, you know, your driver driving instructor will tell you how this this all works and 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 what these various buttons and things mean and this way it he helps you uh, to build your uh, conceptual model and um, now these conceptual models of everyday objects sound pretty trivial um, but we also build conceptual models of highly abstract and complex things for example we all have a conceptual model of how the internet works right sort of. Um, and depending on, you know, your technical um, education, that model may be more detailed and more, you know, closer to the technical reality, or it may be further away from that. Um, so, you know, 
if you want to entertain yourself, ask, you know, ask your dad or mom to explain to you how they think the internet works and, and see what comes out of that, right? Um, and so these models are around us and uh, you can't avoid them being created by users. So we better make sure that there are good ones. This is a little picture that will help you remember this, this uh, relation that you have to the end user of, of your software, uh, that as you are crafting the system image, you should take care of doing a good job <coughs> because what you have in your head is sort of what we could call the design model, the conceptual model of you as a designer creating uh, you know, how you think this should work. Uh, and um, hopefully that will make it across to the user and the user will basically develop the same conceptual model of the, um, of the system that you had in mind when you created the interface. So to give you an example, um, let's say you're developing um, you know, a, a, a file browser, right? Um, and um, you create these little, you, know, you, you, you choose these little yellow folders because you know, you're from the US and everything you've ever filed in your life goes into these little yellow manila folders, they're called. It's a very typical method of, um, of filing in the, in the States. Um, and so you think, hmm, I think I can really represent these digital folders by using these yellow manila folders, right? Because that's something I'm very aware of. It's, 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 it's an everyday experience for me. So let's use that. So everybody should know that. Um, and so you put little yellow folders on to, you know, into, into Windows on the desktop. And then you find after a while um, that, yep, that works pretty well as long as you stay with the you know, North American um, um, customer base. But you know, you come to Germany and nobody, everybody's like, what are these little yellow things? I've never seen those in my life. You know, where are my lights folders, right? <laughs> my binders. Um, and so, so as we see, you know, this, you know, in, in the case of a, a user in, in, in Germany, for example, seeing these yellow, little yellow things, he'll have more trouble building the, the right mental model because that thing that you put into the system image, the yellow folder icon, is not something that speaks to these people uh, readily. So when the designer's conceptual model is problem is different from what emerges as the user's mental model, um, then we're in trouble. And this is an important concept to remember when you're designing user interfaces. Um, I want to give you an example of, of, of what, that, what that means. Um, when uh, Windows XP rolled around, um, and you know, I'm not sure about how this worked in earlier versions, but in Windows XP, uh, I know this, this was the case. There was a trash can, right? And the trash can was on, on your desktop, obviously. It's still on the desktop today if you have a modern version of Windows. Um, and today it works as you would expect, but uh, the trash can on Windows XP was suggesting to people, um, this is where I can, you know, where I can throw things that I want to, that I don't need anymore. But why is the trash can there? You know, it's something like this didn't exist and still doesn't exist in, in um, you know, Unix-based command line shells, right? There you just, you delete a file and if you get a, you know, a, an extra question, do you really want to delete this? And when, once you delete it, that's it, right? It's gone. And the trash can was an idea where, you know, folks said, okay, let's, let's use this metaphor from the office where you can throw a piece of paper, you know, and a contract that you don't no longer need or a document you no longer need, you can throw it into the trash um, and it's gone, but it's not really gone, right? It's, it's sort of out of your way and you're ready for this to be taken away, you know, with the next, the next time the, uh, the trash cans are being emptied. Um, but if you make up your mind and you're like, oh, I threw this away five minutes ago, but I actually need to look up a number on that document, you know, that I just tossed. Everybody has fished something out of their paper basket, right? That they thought they would no longer need. And then like, ah, damn it, I do need this. And this is why there is a trash can um, that you can actually retrieve things from for a little while until in the case of, 
of the computer, you make the conscious decision to empty your trash can. And some people never did that. So they had this you know, gigantic trash can with lots of stuff in there. Others did it you know, all the time. That was your choice. So this is all great. But the problem in the Windows XP trash can was the following. If you threw a file in there, like a Word document, you could open the trash can, you know, double click the icon, open it back up, and you could retrieve that file, no problem. If you threw a folder in there, a folder of documents, then what would happen is, you know, if this was the, if this was the folder, it would basically take the folder and empty out everything that was in the folder as individual documents. So the trash can flattened the folder hierarchies, all folder hierarchies. So imagine you drag you know, um, a collection of all the documents from the last five years that you don't no longer need because you think you've got a good backup. You drag them to the trash can. And a moment later, you decide, oh, no, I should not have deleted that. So in order to retrieve that, you open the trash can, and you've got all the documents from the last five years, but they're all in the root folder. Right? They're no longer are they sorted into subfolders. Um, there's naming conflicts that then, you know, things get renamed weirdly and, and, and the weirdest stuff can happen. So what that means is uh, we're talking still about the conceptual model here, right? The designer had a conceptual model of a trash can, and that makes sense if you implement it right, right? If you implement this, this illusion of a trash can correctly and if it really holds up for all cases. But in the end, the implementation didn't hold up. It had holes. So this illusion was breaking down. It's like a magical trick that you know has sort of gaps somewhere. Um, what did people do? Well, they started with this assumption that this was a trash can, so you could throw a whole folder in and you could throw get it out. Then they probably got bitten by that once. And from then on, a lot of people started creating a folder on their desktop next to the trash can called things I don't need anymore, but that I'm not willing to throw into the trash can because you know the trash can does weird stuff to it. So essentially they sort of created their own trash can. Right? So that effectively made the trash can useless uh, because it wasn't implemented right. The metaphor of the trash can wasn't consistent. Um, so remember, um, one of the, 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 the important things to remember here is when we create an interface, uh, we are creating what you could call an illusion, right? Uh, and this is uh, a, an Apple UI designer once put that into a, a document that was teaching people how to design user interface. He said, interface design is about crafting the user illusion. I really like that. First of all, I think it's really cool if you think about yourself, you know, as a magician, that's pretty, that's pretty nifty. We all want to be magicians, right? Um, but it also reminds you that what the user is seeing is, of course, an illusion, right? There are no tiny little yellow manila folders inside your hard drive. Uh, we create that illusion to, you know, block these ugly things of tracks and sectors and bits and bytes and, and, and symbolic links, et cetera, um, and, and file IDs and whatnot from the user. But we have to make sure that our magical trick actually holds up, right? So that the user illusion, um, the interface illusion doesn't break down. Because if it breaks down in even one aspect, then the user will have to create a new conceptual model. Uh, and that model is surely going to be different from what you were intending, because they're going to make ways around it. I will give you let yet another example of this, because this is such an important point. Um, when I uh, developed uh, my first interactive exhibit as a PhD student in the 90s, um, I was creating a documentary video for that. And that documentary video was being created to uh, become part of my, my first paper that I sent to Kai in like, like 96 or 97. Um, so I used a, um, a pretty convoluted, back in the days, video production was you know kind of a black art in itself, pretty convoluted uh, setup on, on Windows doing that. Um, and I compiled all my little bits and bobs, you know, the screenshots that I wanted in the video and the video fragments that I had captured on camera um, and my subtitles and my audio track. I, I gathered all that together and put it into this, you know, video production software uh, and was hoping that, you know, I could now render out the video. So I rendered out the video. It turned out that uh, some things were just missing, but they were, there was no error 
you know, we mentioned some screenshots were just, there was a blank space where that screenshot should have been in the final video. After many, many hours that I spent at the lab, you know, nights, because of course this was close to the deadline and I really had to get this video done. Um, I discovered something. I discovered that all the things that were missing were things that had been A, on an external drive, so network drive, and B, uh, they had file names that were longer than the old 8 plus 3 DOS convention. But this was, you know, late 90s. So the DOS convention of 8 plus 3 file names had long been removed by Windows. Windows had said, you can use long file names. It's perfectly fine. You use long file names, forget about the 8 plus 3 from DOS years. And so I had, but that software had used some kind of library that when it was connecting to a network drive, actually somehow fell back onto that 8 plus 3 file name convention. And that you know bit me in the behind quite radically at that point. So as a result, what that led to, of course, was me just thinking, okay, it's Windows, but you can't really trust the long file name thing. I'm going to stick with 8 plus 3 for the next you know, couple of years until all this gets sorted out. So the whole effort that Windows had put into creating this illusion of long file names uh, broke and led to me and lots of other people still, I mean, you still find people today who name their things with 8 plus 3 because you never know, you know. Um, so this is why the, the illusion has to be consistent and complete so that it doesn't have these holes that then make people doubt your, doubt your illusion and work around it. All right, so that, that, that's it about the conceptual model, important concept to, to understand. Uh, and next we're gonna talk about mappings. Mappings are awesome because they are really, especially the, 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 the physical ones we're gonna talk about here are really easy to understand uh, and they are absolutely ubiquitous and they are responsible for so many mistakes that we make every day um, and so many you know, hiccups with interacting with technology um, that are quite hilarious really. So mappings are, you know, you know mappings from computer science, from mathematics lectures, right? A mapping is typically takes numbers from one domain and maps them to another domain. Like it's, it's you know, related to functions. Um, and it's, it's, it's similar here. Our mappings are relationships between um, controls, actions, and the intended results. What I mean by this is, um, while in mathematics, a, a, a mapping is a relation between elements from two different sets, for us, it's basically a mapping between, uh, for example, this switch we're seeing there on this picture um, and the lights that it turns on or off. And the, uh, or, you know, the joystick that you see there and the thing that it controls in the, in the virtual world of, of a computer game. So mappings connect user interface elements to the real world. And notice that this works both ways, right? Um, you can have, things like this joystick there, um, which is an input device, uh, also often called a control. Um, and this will influence, in this case, um, the virtual world inside the computer, right? So the computer picks up the data from that input device and does something similar to it uh, with the result. In this case, you know, displaying how your car, your virtual car moves when you're playing Grand Theft Auto, for example. Um, the light switch similarly is in a way an input device to a much, much, much simpler interactive system, which is you know, the, the light switch circuit and you know, consisting in the simplest case just of that switch, some power source and a bulb. So your input to the switch will have an effect in this case, not in a virtual world inside the computer, which is then rendered on the screen, but in this case will have an effect in the real world directly uh, by turning on a light. But it also works for output uh, um, on the output side, and this is often forgotten. Um, when you have something that needs to be displayed, for example, let's say you are building a, a user interface of a, a process control, right? That is you know, overseeing some chemical process, and you know you've got a temperature in, in some kind of kettle uh, that needs to be monitored. Then you might have a um, you might have an actual um, you know, thermometer that's stuck to the side of the kettle that's showing the, the temperature on a little gauge, or you may have an on-screen um, you know, virtual display that shows the temperature as a number or as a, as, a, as a slider that moves up and down or something like this. 
So in this case, we have the real world um, being, you know, a, a value from the real world being shown on an output device of a sensor of some kind. But we can also have things in the virtual world, which is, for example, the, the internal setting of the sound uh, cards or your sound system's uh, volume um, that is being displayed in this sound slider here that we're seeing here. Um, so that's a virtual world um, piece of data that's being rendered into an output device. Um, in this case, on the display of, of, your, of your laptop, for example. Now, OK, so we understand mappings are between these, on the one hand, input devices, controls, and what their effect is in a real or virtual world, or something in the real or virtual world and how it is being displayed, uh, communicated to the user using output devices, displays, widgets, if you like. Now, when are these mappings good? These mappings are good when they are natural. That's the basically a good mapping is a natural mapping. And what we mean by natural mappings, we're going to talk more about these various kinds of natural mappings here in the following slides, but what they all have in common is that natural mappings are mappings that you will understand immediately as a user, uh, making them very easy to remember and ultimately enabling a, a better ease of use, making things easier to use. Now, what is, what is a natural mapping? A good mapping is a natural mapping. What does that mean? Uh, there are at least three or four different ways of natural mappings. Um, and, and these different kinds we're going to go through in e e each at a time. The easiest one is the first one, and that is the spatial analogy, where the kind of movement I do as a user for an input device now, speaking for you know input device to effect in the world, um, the thing I do on the device is the same kind of movement uh, in the same direction as the effect in the real world. This also holds for output device. We'll talk about that in a second. The others, uh, perceptual, biological, and cultural ones, um, are a little less obvious to understand, but we're going to talk about them in detail. But let's get to the spatial analogies first. And for this, I have a little in-class exercise for you to think about. Um, so spatial analogies are the most prominent example of natural mappings and the one that's easiest to understand and, and is really very, very frequent in, in interface design. Um, here's a little thought um, experiment. Let's assume you have this lifting platform, right, to lift up cars. And you are tasked with designing the interface that goes onto that black little side um, panel there where the, uh, the mechanic gets to control how the car moves up and down this rotary lift. Um, how would you arrange the controls for this lifting platform? You can raise your little yellow hand and uh, I'll, I'll uh, call you up. Frederick, go ahead. Yeah, so I would basically use a little lever with up being up and down being down. Okay. Uh, good, up being up and down being bound, that's a good idea. Um, so you would probably not put them so next to each other because then every time we walk up to it, uh, you would actually have to look at the levers and you know, at the lever and think, okay, was it to the left to go up or to the right to go up? You know, So you put them up and down. Um, Shalish, what, what's your th uh, thoughts on this? Yeah, so I think I would just use two buttons, uh, one with an uh, up arrow on it, prominently displayed, and the other with a down arrow. So they'll be mm -hmm. they'll be separate, and a person would know that pressing the up arrow key would move the car up or down. Right, and you would again put the up arrow key above the yeah. down arrow, right? Yeah, because that is the important part here. Um, Imagine that you know one day you know, after after years of use, the, the writing on these buttons rubs off. Right? Remember, things that have labels on them, like up or down on the button, is sort of is sort of like a, a user manual for the interface. So it should work even without the labels, right? If you put them next to each other, everybody's going to be confused. If you put them above each other, and at some point the labels rub off, most people will still be fine and understand what they do. Theo. Um, I would maybe use a slider, like uh -huh. instead of buttons, use a slider that is like more precise and you don't have to look at it. You just know that up is up and down is down. Yeah, 
You could use a slider. Uh, so let's talk about these three options here. Now, the first one we already said is a bad idea uh, and uh, you know, putting these things next to each other because without the labels, nobody would know. So you always need to look at the label. Very hard to learn by heart. Um, the second solution is much better. And uh, uh, you, you could put, of course, arrows on them. You know, then you don't have a language dependency and they're maybe, maybe even more intuitive than the, than the wording on them. Um, but the crucial point here is not what's on the buttons, but how they are positioned next to each other, right? Um, above each other, they are in the same order. Up is up and down is down. You know, the up button is above the down button, just as the up position of the car is above the down position of the car. Very simple. Um, but the, uh, the, the slider uh, that, that Theo just mentioned is actually a third solution. And to understand which is sort of the best here, we already know the left-hand solution here with up and down next to each other is not, not going to be great. But uh, which of the other two is better? Um, there is a couple of different angles you can take on this. Let's take the angle of pure sort of natural mapping mess, so to say. And in that case, think about what the up and down buttons really do. They don't, oh yeah, go ahead, Amit. Uh, yeah, like uh, we can make buttons in a triangular form, like up, uh, the up uh, will be facing like pointing upwards, the down mm -hmm. button will be pointing downwards. Some mm -hmm. button, yeah, like that. Now, this is also a good idea um, to have the up button you know, shaped in a triangle form. Um, but independent on how you form them, we are currently talking about the arrangement of those two. And Frederick, I think you initially mentioned a, a, a lever being pushed up uh, or down, right? To start moving the car up or down. Um, can you explain, Frederick, how your lever would work in, in exactly? So what happens when I push the lever? So yes, when, when you push the lever, it just starts going up in a constant speed. And if you push it down, it starts going down in a constant speed. Mm -hmm. um, I would say mm -hmm. for the buttons, uh, one problem would be that it controls the same tool, but in two, uh, in two different directions. So it inverts the function of the other. So uh, one could ask what would happen if we, if we push both buttons at the same time. Um, so I think one tool, like a lever or a slider, uh, mm -hmm. would be better, like one, uh, yeah, one uh, interface. Yeah, OK, so that's an excellent point that I hadn't uh, considered. Actually, the, uh, the two buttons do raise the question of what happens when you press them both at the same time, which you can avoid if you have a, a, a lever that you flop up or down. Or if you have, um, you know, one of those toggle switches that, you know, you can only press one side of at, at a time. Um, now, uh, I think we have a couple more hands up. So, uh, Janvi, go ahead. Uh, just to correct, it's Janvi. So, like, I was uh, saying that we can have three buttons for up and three buttons for down like uh, we can have certain levels for up and certain levels for down like we want to make it reach at the top so we won't be pressing keep pressing up 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 again so we can just press the topmost button to make it at the highest level ah uh -huh. okay yeah uh, i like your thinking that's also a solution we hadn't seen before so that would introduce sort of buttons that represent certain positions on the yeah, exactly. on the on the lift. Good. Um, before we take more um, questions here, I want to uh, get back to the uh, the the difference here between these two buttons, uh, up or down, and the and the slider. If you think about the uh, two buttons, what they really do is whether it's you know uh, um, the uh, Frederick's uh, uh, lever that you flip up or down, or whether it's two buttons. Um, or even if it is the um, the kind of uh, multiple buttons that uh, uh, that John we just mentioned, they all control not the position of the car, but actually the first derivative of its position. They control the rate of change of position of the car. And mathematically speaking, that's its first derivative. And you see this all the time in computer interfaces in, in interactive devices. For example, if you have uh, an alarm clock and you need to increase the time, oftentimes you need to hold down the button. And while you hold down the button, the time increases, right? 
can't just turn a wheel to set it to the time that you want. You have to hold the button as long as needed until you get to the time. So the up and down buttons are a very common solution that you will see oftentimes um, to control a value and change a value. There will often be buttons that increment or decrement it, but be aware that that's already a first derivative of the original function. And in that particular respect, the actual slider um, is the direct control, right? The slider could be the moment, you know, wherever the slider is, that's where the car is. You would need a pretty beefy, you know, uh, hydraulic system to make that happen. Um, and so you could, you know, just flick the slider to the top and the car would go woof and be up there. Um, and you could, you know, pull it down three quarters, it would come down three quarters. Um, now, that would be problematic from a work safety point of view, right? You know, imagine there's, you know, your, 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 your new trainee is lying under the car trying to fix something and, and you stumble on the control and, and you push the slider down all the way with your elbow. That makes a lot of a mess out of your trainee and there's gonna be a lot of paperwork to fill out with that accident happening. Um, so work safety wise, probably not the best idea to move the car you know, at arbitrary speeds up and down this, this, uh, this ramp. Uh, but from a pure point of the naturalness of the mapping, it would be the most natural control you could have, That's basically. Yeah. Uh, so it's similar to, you know, or it may, you know, being able to hold onto the car itself and just gently push it up or down. And because, you know, this movement is somehow detected by a sensor, uh, then a strong hydraulic arm kicks in and sort of, you know, magnifies your movement. So you feel like Iron Man, you know, lifting that car up and down. Those kinds of controls would be the ultimate um, natural mappings. Everything else is an approximation, is only controlling the first derivative. And what that also means is that when you're controlling the first derivative, you are automatically in a time-based user interface because you have to hold that button as long as necessary to, for, the, for the car to reach its final position. Uh, and again, for work safety reasons or for mechanical or cost reasons, this may be the, the, the most uh, you know, salient solution, the most appropriate one. But from a pure point of control, this time-based control of the first derivative, rather than being able to control the position directly, is decoupling you. And it's awkward. And it's, it, it eats into your time. And it, it makes things less pleasant to use rather than being able to control that value directly. Um, now, Pascal, you got yeah, you had your hand up. Did you have another um, option uh, yeah, for us would, to look into? I would argue that uh, the lever is somewhat compl uh, complicated because an, in an industrial environment, you work with greasy things, and uh, the normal way of having interface is uh, those little buttons with the rubber dome on it, so the grease does mm -hmm. not get into the uh, I guess mm -hmm. the mechanical systems mm -hmm. and doesn't mess with the internals of, of the thing. And mm -hmm. as I already mentioned, you can stumble upon the lever and maybe crush your, let's yeah. say, internship uh, doing yeah. some work and uh, yeah, wouldn't be as yeah. great as it should be. Good, yeah, the, the absolutely valid comments, not just the, the work safety thing that we all agree on, uh, but also point that especially um, slider values, Mechanical sliders, you know, sliding up and down a groove, are prone to to dirt and and grease getting in, and and so that building that kind of control in a reliable way so that it wouldn't clog up, uh, if it's possible at all, would certainly be more expensive um, than those buttons. And the other point that you uh, that you kind of mentioned, and there was also, we see these uh, these buttons everywhere, right? These these two simple buttons for to control those kinds of things. So there's also something to be said for even if the slider was the most natural control, um, people are so used to these buttons that they will probably find the slider somewhat alienating. And this is the tension we always find ourselves in. You can often improve on a user interface, but to do that, sometimes you are breaking with suboptimal standard user interfaces that exist. And whether to break with that or not is a decision that will depend on you know, how many people are going to be using this kind of system for the first time so they can immediately pick up the new one and be more productive with it? How many people need to be retrained? Um, 
what's the cost of retraining? So there's lots of considerations there, which we will actually get into later this uh, this semester. Okay. Uh, okay. One more, Charlize, and then we need to move on. Go on. Hello. Uh, yeah. So um, as Frederick said, that there could be a possibility of people pressing both the buttons together. But mm -hmm. uh, what if we tackle that issue with using something like a dead man's button, where you have to press that button and only then you can press the up or the down arrow key or a key where you have to rotate it and keep, uh, keep it locked in a specific position uh, to use the buttons. So mm -hmm. uh, with that, both your hands are engaged and you can't press both the buttons together. Probably separate the up and down buttons by some distance so that it's difficult to do it in one hand. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so first of all, uh, technically that could be a viable solution. But note where, where you're going then, you are now adding a key to the control of this thing. So we're making things way more complicated. Either a key or a button, essentially, where yeah. you have to press it to engage it. And But again, this yeah. is suggesting then uh, that people will need both hands to operate the, the height control. Yeah. Um, and now imagine uh, somebody working in this place. I don't know, but... I have a hunch that there is a good chance that folks would, for example, have something in their hand, like you know, their wrench, and then they need to move the car. So now they need to put their hand, wrench down to move the car with both hands. Um, so I think in this case, people pressing both buttons at the same time is not a disaster happening. Uh, I don't think we need a security lockout for that. Uh, we'll get to these lockouts and under the um, concept of constraints, by the way, um, in, in just a few minutes. Um, so in this case, I think we would just find a reasonable uh, solution. What what is supposed to happen when you press both buttons? Like you know, the thing could just stop and not do anything until you let go of one button. Uh, all right, thank you. Um, so you can see, um, this is a simple, a super simple system. Uh, oh, Jami, is is that a new hand or is that your old hand still up? Uh, yeah, it's a new one. So I was saying that as you said that uh, with the slider or the more buttons, it will be like a first derivative. But uh, I would say that uh, uh, like we can have more buttons, but the speed of the car of moving up can be constant. Like uh, it would be the same speed if you press one button thrice or just another high, an higher button once. So we can have the speed constant. Uh, yes, yes, you could. Uh, but again, remember the complexity, right? Uh, remember that uh, now you were beginning to get to a system where you might have to write a user manual for people to operate this controller. So uh, I appreciate the ideas. They really uh, shine a light on lots of different challenges that are in these in these controls. Uh, but my point in the end for this was also not designed the perfect, you know, uh, uh, lift control that that goes through all the you know pragmatic explanations. And, and that works in, in practice. My point was really just using this as an example of understanding what natural mapping spatial analogies mean, right? This up is up and down is down is already the first thing. And this is often fairly easy to do if you know that, that it's important. So the rule that we have from this is sort of arranging controls in the same way that their real world counterparts are arranged. Um, this also applies, for example, for room lamps, right? If you've ever walked into a room uh, and there, is a, uh, there are like three different switches underneath each other as they tend to be in, 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 in European or in, in German households, um, then you're always like, okay, so which switch does what, right? Which lamp does relate to which one? Um, so if you have got lamps on the right and lamps on the left of a room and the switches are on the right and left, then it makes sense to arrange them in the same way so that the mapping is natural. A similar example is um, uh, your car stereo, right? So the stereo in your car has um, a couple of controllers. Like for example, um, you know, how do you how do you control the volume in your car? Well, so the most natural setting uh, design would be a slider that goes up to increase volume and down to decrease volume. We're not seeing a lot of these sliders in cars these days. Um, although, you know, those kinds of interfaces now become more possible again with the you know, increasing use of touchscreens. Um, we usually see rotary sliders, right? rotary knobs. And so rotary knobs have sort of taken on a representative of, of, the, of the slider by basically making that right turn 
of the knob equivalent to increasing a value on a slider. So we've gotten kind of used to it. It's not a natural mapping per se anymore, but we see it in, in many different areas. And so um, it, become, it starts becoming a, a convention that we are pretty used to. Now a fader, for example, that you know, moves uh, the sound to the left and right, if you've, uh, or to the back and front even on your car, that is super complicated, right? Because now you've got a, you're sitting in your car, you've got your dashboard in front of you, and there's a knob that you can only turn to the left and right, you know, clockwise or counterclockwise, and it's mapped to front or back of your car. And there, it's really not obvious what the right mapping is. You know, is turning to the right at the front or is turning to the right at the rear? So at this point, you notice that the natural mapping becomes really tricky. And again, the most natural one, of course, if you want to move sound to the front or to, or to the back, would be a slider that moves to the front and back of the car. Right? That would be a little bit more, a uh, little bit more natural. Now. Um, these natural mappings and spatial analogies are the easiest example of natural mappings work well for these, um, you could call them output centered controls, right? Where you really want to control the state of a particular device. But uh, when you get to activities, it becomes trickier. For ex with activity center controls, um, I mean things like, um, you know, a button that sets, the lights in my living room to, and the volume of the TV and everything to watching a movie, right? Um, there is no longer a natural spatial analogy to that. Um, so this becomes harder to do uh, in, in a natural, uh, to use spatial analogies for interfaces that do these things. Um, also, these activity center controls are great if they are designed very carefully and they really capture the activities that are going to happen in that space well. Um, I'll give you an example for how that's not done well. Uh, we have a room where we teach DIS1 usually in the computer science building. And in, in there, um, you, have a, uh, you, know, you, have a, you have a light control where if you, can, if you dim down the lights, um, you know, setting it sort of to a, to a movie mode, uh, then after a while, because everybody you know sits there and watches the movies, then the lights actually turn back on um, because it thinks like, okay, so obviously nothing is going on anymore, so we need to move out of this mode. Or imagine a setting where uh, if you are in lecture mode and you increase the lighting, uh, then you know the system thinks, oh, this is no longer a lecture. I'll turn off the projector. Right? Um, those kinds of things are tricky to to uh, predict, and so activity center controls these kind of smart scenarios, as we call them in smart home settings today, scenario-based controls are really tricky. If you're trying to build your own smart home at home, you know what I'm talking about. It's always um, tricky to actually catch all the cases uh, and make sure that they don't act in a way that you don't want them to. Here's a wonderful example uh, that I found in the, uh, the new university clinic uh, in Heidelberg uh, a couple of years ago. And um, this is the elevator, right? So I have a couple questions for you that you, I want you to think about. Uh, the first one is, how many floors do you have, think this building has? Any thoughts, Tanvir? Uh, there might be two, two floors. Might be two, yeah. Uh, 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 Frederick? There also might be a hundred, but 98 of those are not accessible. Mm -hmm. Yep, we don't know. Uh, so, Pascal? Uh, it seems like uh, an elevator just to get to a helipad, just having the upper layer. <laughs> yeah, right. So, okay, so I, I, will, I will solve that riddle for you. Um, it's two floors, but What's ridiculous is that we even need to discuss this, right? That we even have any kind of doubt about how many floors there are. So this is confusing. Next question, which of these buttons goes up? Janvi? 99. Okay. Shalesh, what do you think? You agree? Same, yeah. Yeah, so 99 should be up. 
Henrik, it's got your hand up. I don't know there are any buildings in Germany that have 99 floors. So 99 is probably like a stand-in for minus one, so the basement. So I would guess there are at least two floors and 99 goes down to the basement. Haha, <laughs> okay. Uh, Andy? Yeah, I, I was going to say that like in normal reading order, like from left to right, you would probably mm -hmm. guess that zero zero is like the upper level. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, oh, Nazim, yeah, go ahead. Last one. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, I think that 1990 is a code for emergency. And maybe uh, in hospital, the 99 is related to that. Right. Okay. So thank you. Uh, wonderful ideas. Wonderful. This shows your mind at work, right? Your mind is trying to make sense. You're all building conceptual models of this elevator panel as, you, as you're looking at it. Um, and uh, again, I can, I can solve the riddle. Um, uh, actually, uh, you got pretty close there uh, because it is actually a two-story building um, and it is built into the ground rather than up. Uh, so zero, zero is the ground floor and 99 is the first basement floor and they were expecting more basement floors to be built ultimately lower than that to go further into the ground. But again, how crazy is that, that we are actually discussing, you know, which button might be up or which button might be down. Now, um, I don't know what was going on here. I, my assumption is, you know, the guy who came in to, to mount these, these controls, he brought his little toolbox. And then in the morning, he was like, oh, crap, I forgot the minus, you know, the negative numbers today. I didn't bring them. Uh, so what do we have here? Let's see. Hmm, okay. Uh, yeah, I got a 99, and if you add one to 99, it's 100, and that kind of rolls around to being zero, zero. I don't know. Let's just use that. I don't know what was going on in their head, right? It's, it's, it's pretty wacky. But why am I showing this? Because you just learned about natural mappings, and you can fix this. You can make this easier to use, even if you only have these stupid 99 and zero, zero labels. What would you do? Johannes? Uh, yeah, you could uh, arrange them so that the upper floor is on top of the lower floor. Yes, yes, of course, right? That's so easy. And then it doesn't matter at all what it says on there. It could say, you know, orange and apple on these two buttons. It doesn't matter. Everybody will guess, well, I suppose the button above is the one that goes to the top floor and the button below goes down, right? That's, that's we immediately assume that because of spatial analogies. Okay, so solve that. And now here's an extra bonus question for those guys who paid attention this whole last hour. If you do that, if you just take the panel as it is and you just flip buttons around, so zero, zero is now above 99. Um, there is another reason why that is a better arrangement. There is another principle that you will then be using to your advantage. Look closely at the at the panel and the placement of these these button cutouts. What other principle will work to help you and help the user make sense of this panel more easily in that case? Philip? Yeah, I think uh, the buttons are in the in the vertical line are a bit closer together. So the the law of proximity applies here, I think. Exactly. Exactly, right? The moment you move these buttons above each other, the related buttons like close and open or 99 and zero, uh, they become grouped by perception because of the law of proximity. So that would be another cue that would help people to you know, parse this interface more quickly, chunk it up into, okay, open, close doors stuff and, and you know, um, moving around um, in the uh, up and down in the uh, in the elevator stuff. So even if these buttons were not labeled at all, actually, uh, you know, if you arrange them that way, this would probably be one of the assumptions people would sort of build in their heads. OK, great. Um, I'm going to move on to another example, then, if that's OK. Um, this is a stove that I had uh, in my old apartment, um, and it had you know, four, uh, four plates at the top. Um, and right here, you can see me reaching out towards it. It has these four buttons at the, at the bottom here, right? Um, 
Now, the problem with this is, and this is how a lot of uh, you know, stovetops are built, is that these four buttons are aligned left to right in one line. So there is no natural mapping that I can, you know, no spatial analogy being used to map these four buttons to the four heating plates, right? Because of that, because of this fail in, in interface design, the designers went ahead and used, you know, the designer's equivalent of hot glue, which is a label, right? So they, they put little labels next to each button. Um, and as you can see, you know, the left one is for the, uh, is for the baking oven here. And then there come four, uh, uh, four buttons and they have these little, you know, four squares, these little four plates and one is colored in and the others are hollow. So that's telling me which button is for which plate. All right, you might say, well, that's a good enough solution. But then if you step up to the, the thing to actually use it, um, you know, you can't see those markings anymore, right? Um, so that's kind of a, a, a double fail, I suppose. So what's wrong with this stove? Um, the controls are not using a natural mapping because, you know, the four hot plates that you see there at the top are um, controlled by four buttons that in blue that are in line. In line again, we can you know we can use uh, uh, we can use a little bit of mathematics here with four different buttons mapping to four different uh, plates. We actually have four factorial uh, equals twenty four possible arrangements that these buttons could represent. Um, and without looking at you know the markings, which I can't see when I'm standing at the stove actually to use it, um, you know that really makes it hard to, 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 to build a mental model of which one is mapped how. Now, not all of these mappings would make sense. Some of these are so hilariously stupid that nobody would ever do them. Um, so for example, we could immediately assume that the two left buttons will probably still somehow belong to the two left um, uh, stovetops and the two right buttons will hopefully belong to the two right ones, right? Uh, but that still leaves four possible arrangements um, in there. And even if you assume that the arrangement is the same on both sides, so that it's sort of mirrored over, that still leaves the question, okay, are the back plates in the middle controls or are the middle controls controlling the front two plates, right? We don't know. So we do require those labels, you know, the, the hot glue for the designer. Uh, so this is indicating a, a less than perfect design. Now, what could we do about this? Well, there's a couple bunch of things we can do. For example, we could have an actual control that is mapped just like the stovetop itself, right? Now, of course, if I can't, if I can't see the labels, um, that makes it impossible to read them. But if the controls are arranged that way, I could actually step up to the, to the stove and use them without actually having to see the labels. I could just feel the four buttons and I could use that mapping. And notice that we're actually already using a sort of uh, transformation here. So in an ideal world, those four controls will be in front of those four uh, plates from a mapping point of view, but you don't maybe want those, those controls sticking out of your, of your heating surface, right? So we're moving them to the front, thereby we're folding them basically down in 90 degrees, but that actually works quite well for people because as you look at them here in 90 degrees, the ones at the top are further away from you than, than the bottom um, if you tilt them into the, into the horizontal plane. So we have a pretty easy time as humans mapping this, uh, doing this mapping, like something that I'm looking at straight on to map that to a horizontal plane. Um, we could also move the four buttons onto the stove top and put them right next to the, uh, to the heater, heating plates. That's often the case when you have gas, right? Gas often has a little control right next to each gas uh, outlet uh, because there's the, st the space with the, with, the, uh, with, the, um, with the height difference where you can put these controls without them sticking out so that you don't, you don't hit them accidentally with your pots and pans. Or we don't need to go all the way here, what we did on the left and map these uh, things in the exact same way as the plates on the top. We could actually use a sort of semi-tilted arrangement, right? Because when I look at the stovetop, um, and, and Ollie did a, a fantastic artistic rendering here of the stovetop, um, the, the plates, thank you, Ollie, uh, the plates are sort of 
you know, tilted away from you, right? You're looking at that surface uh, um, plane from a, an angle. So the back plates are not just a little smaller and farther away, but they're also a little bit more inwards. So that arrangement actually kind of looks like the blue arrangement of the four dots here in the lower right. Um, so in, the, in a way, that would be a mapping that could suggest a, a perspective tilt to the user and would maybe be a little easier to pick up. And it wouldn't require quite as much vertical space as this first one here on your front plate, because the front plate isn't arbitrarily high, right? It's often limited to a certain height because you need to still put a baking oven beneath it. And so, you know, the this four by four arrangement, the two by two arrangement might not work, but something like that could work. You just need a little bit of extra vertical space and would help you understand the mapping and remember it more easily. Okay, so those are all ways that you could improve this. Um, if all else fails, there's often the, the, the emergency exit of industry standards, right? So if everybody uses the same mapping and it's not obvious, it's not a spatial analogy, but it's always the same, uh, then that works too, right? This is what we've gotten used to in, for example, car radios. If there is a turning knob, we know that if we turn it to the right, the volume will go up, right? Nobody's gonna map the volume to go up when you turn it to the left, right? Nobody would do that. Um, and so, this is a this is a fairly uh, you know it, it, it's 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 the cop out right it's it's uh, kind of on the same level of badness as putting labels onto it but it's it's a solution if nothing else works. That's spatial analogies. Um, next up, we've got perceptual analogies, and perceptual analogies uh, work a little differently. They actually. Uh, are imitating the device that you're controlling. So in this case, the UI is an imitation of the device itself. Um, an example here that you'll also find in the uh, Design of Everything's book is this uh, Mercedes car seat control. Um, this is the control that you find on the, on the um, like in the door, for example. And if you look at it, it's a tiny car seat, right? And if you, you know, take the little backrest from that car, tiny car seat and, you know, push it forward, that's actually going to tilt you know, your, your car seat, your actual car seat backrest forward. Or if you push the seating area up with your fingers on that little control, the actual seating area will raise. Again, it is at first derivative control, right? So as we push, we start a motor that then whirs and, and starts doing the movement. It's not a, a direct mapping in that sense. It's a first derivative, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a perceptual analogy that it's pretty easy to understand once you've seen it. Um, these perceptual analogies are obviously closely linked to the Gestalt laws, right? We, we see this thing, we group it accordingly, um, we make the right, uh, we derive the right controls from it. Um, and this gives you a great control um, of something if you can afford it. But of course, this is more expensive than just putting a few simple buttons into the door um, and so that's why it's often um, not done in, in cheaper models. Next up, we've got biological analogies. Um, so here's a little bit of a, an in-class exercise. Um, if you take a few, uh, let's, let's just, why don't you just call out a few physical measurements here? Uh, things that you could measure in the physical world. Um, anything really. We don't need to go with hands uh, we'll just collect a few. What are things that you could measure in the physical world with with some kind of um, you know uh, device or that you might need to display on the screen? Length. Length. Okay. Uh, rotation. Rotation. Rotation is a good one. Thank you. Um, no. Air temperature. Temperature. Yes. Brightness. Weight. Brightness, yes, weight. Okay. Pressure. What was that? Pressure. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I didn't understand the word. Did you catch it, Dolly? Pressure or applying pressure. Oh, pressure, got you, thank you. Yep, sorry. Um, yeah, the, the, the joys of online uh, Zoom meetings. Uh, pressure, sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, we got. Say again? Gas concentration. 
gas concentration. Okay, that's enough to, to get a first idea. Most of the things you named, brightness, pressure, uh, length, you know, I think somebody mentioned volume too. Uh, most of these are what you would consider additive dimensions. Additive dimensions are all those dimensions where you can easily say, and everybody will agree, there is a less and a more. Right? Everybody will agree volume, you know, there's a, a more and a less. Um, everybody will agree that with pressure, there's higher pressure and lower pressure. And everybody will agree with, for example, brightness or, or something like this, or length, you know, what, whatever is more or less. Whenever you have one of those additive dimensions, it's a great idea to map them to a up and down control, if you can. Just like this thermometer is suggesting there, right? Temperature is one of those. Uh, also where more is clearly uh, defined. And so mapping that to the up direction and mapping less to the down direction is a great way of providing a, uh, an, a highly intuitive mapping, both for controls, to control these values in a, in a process, in a chemical process plant, for example, but also to display them in an, in an interface. Um, but somebody said rotation. And if rotation is given in, in degrees, for example, then things become a little trickier. I mean, you could still say if it's just a rotation, let's say from zero to 90 degrees, we could still have a slider that goes from you know, zero to 90 and goes up. And the more I push it up, the higher it is. But rotation is, in, is directly, you know, should be something that we probably want to ma see mapped onto a rotating interface or onto a rotating scale to actually indicate the angle of rotation, right? That would make more sense. And it gets even trickier with some other things. For example, color. Is red more than green? Eh, we don't know, right? So these dimensions where it doesn't work to say there is less and more, and everybody agrees on, on that, are called substitutive dimensions. Uh, another example would be uh, location. You know, um, you've got your coordinates on a, on a map. Uh, there is no more or less, right, in, in two coordinates on a map. Um, or you could take taste. I mean, there is the sense of saltier and less salty, but is bitter more than, than uh, sour? Not really, right? They're substituted. They're different. Um, so for all of those, you can't easily define a simple one-dimensional more and less additive dimension mapping. So in a word, whenever you have an additive dimension to control, uh, consider having a simple up and down display or control to, uh, to control it. If you, know, you have substitutive dimensions, you need to come to com more complex things. But all the additive ones, you really are helping people if you provide these kinds of mappings. Pitch, by the way, audio pitch is an interesting one because some people will answer that a higher pitch means more. And other people will consider a lower pitch to be more because it sounds more substantial, like a bigger object making the sound. Uh, so that's where things start to break down. So audio pitch is not quite as easily mapped to less and, and more. And time is a super tricky beast. Um, if we're just talking about the amount of time, like how long are you going to set an egg timer? Clearly, five minutes is more than three minutes. So no problem there. Uh, but the circular notion of time uh, no longer matches that, right? Is Sunday more than Wednesday? Not really, right? And, and we even have cultural differences on which, which day of the, the, week, uh, the week starts. So these biological analogies um, work well with these an, um, additive dimensions, especially that we can usually create a very natural mapping. Another natural map uh, analogy um, is the order from top to bottom. And this is actually one that is not cultural, but actually natural. Again, we can sort of understand this. Um, if you look at the writing systems in the world, there's lots of writing systems out there, you know, um, apart from our, our, our Western um, Roman writing system, you've got things like Hebrew, um, and, and you've got writings in, uh, in Asian countries that, that go, for example, you know, top down, for example. Uh, but 
we don't have any writing systems that go bottom up. That there's just something you know that's highly impractical about that because as you're writing or something, you know, if you were to go, you know, bottom up, you would constantly be going over what you just wrote, um, and and that's not very that's not very handy. Uh, and we also have the fact that as we look out into the plane, um, our eyes are above ground, right? And so things that are further away uh, tend to be, uh, you know, tend to be uh, f further down in the in in our uh, perspective than things that are closer closer to us. So top to bottom is a pretty um, is a universal analogy that is biologically um, given to us. Uh, things fall from top to bottom. That, that's what gravity does, right? Um, cultural, uh, culturally, though, um, I would say left to right, for example, is, is not a biological analogy. It's a cultural analogy, right? So anybody used to the Western writing system uh, will consider left to right a natural order. But anybody um, uh, used to Hebrew writing, for example, will maybe consider right to left a more natural order. So this is not something you can apply universally. And that's often a mistake that's been made that people assume from their own cultural circle that you know, this is how the entire world thinks. Um, this traffic sign is interesting, right? Because it actually uses um, this biological analogy and also a, a cultural analogy in combination to work. So the first ones, are of course cultural, right? Red means stop in the in the Western world, not everywhere, but in our uh, in our hemisphere. And um, we, unless you're in the UK or in some other countries like Australia, we drive on the right hand side of the road. So people are, you know, suggest are associating the right arrow with this is me, right, and not the other the the, the opposing traffic. But there is something else going on here, because. Um, when you think about how you look out if you're sitting in your car and you've got things approaching you, then as you, as you drive out, you are sort of driving, your, your eyes are going up, right? So assume you look at something on the road that's like 10 meters away, and then you look at something that's 20 meters away, and you look at something that's 30 meters away. These things will actually, since you are above ground, will actually rise in your perception, right? So they will be stacked up above each other. So this is why a, an arrow pointing up is actually something that we readily associate with going forward, as opposed to the arrow pointing down. Um, and so this is another reason why this, this sign works, because the arrow pointing up is what we associate with our own movement. Uh, and so we understand, oh, that's meant for us. We are moving in the direction of the arrow in a way. And so this other one must be the opposing traffic. OK. Uh, <coughs> here's another example. This is a, I'm being a little tough here on the Swedes, but sorry, the, the examples just happen to come together this way. You know, there's a lot of great things about Swedish design. I love, I love a lot of it, but uh, this was something that um, uh, Peter Kranz uh, pointed out. Um, he, he later won a, a, a Swedish World Usability Day design contest. Um, and he pointed out this Stockholm ticket machine. Um, and so let's assume that we uh, know nothing about, about this machine. Um, how would we go about using it? Well, this is how, what you need to do. You would have to first start in the middle and press uh, a blue button one to two, up to three times uh, to tell the machine if you want a ticket for zone A, A and B, or A, B and C. Then what you need to do is you need to move down uh, and press the second blue button once for a regular ticket or twice for a reduced price ticket. Then you move up to the top here um, and swipe your credit card on the top left side of the machine. Then you move back to the center and press the green button once. And then your actual ticket comes out here to the left. Now, the problem with that is, of course, that you know, when you do it this way, this is not a natural order, right? This is not following the idea of top to bottom interaction. Because since we parse things from top to bottom, we make a natural assumption that if an interface is presented to us with different things we need to do in it, 
we, we kind of go from top to bottom as well. And so here, that's clearly not the case. So what do we need to do instead? Well, um, you know, because of the, the interface is designed so badly, there is like all these instructions to the right here, what you need to do. And you can see they try it with numbers, right? So number one is here, number two is below, and number three is way up there, and then four is here, and then, you know, it, it's a mess, right? So redesigning this could look something like this, right? So the first thing you do is you pick a zone, uh, one, two, or three. Uh, and the second thing is then, you know, you pay. And then the third thing is uh, you get your ticket, right? Uh, and you don't need to speak Swedish to understand this kind of machine, right? It's kind of, you know, reasonably obvious, at least in what steps you would, you would go through it. Uh, and and uh, the button at the very top, by the way, uh, says uh, uh, press this for, for speech. And it also has a, um, has a, um, a braille um, rendering on it, uh, all the buttons do um, for, for people who are blind. Um, so by resorting the interface of that machine, uh, we could make it much easier to use. Because remember, a lot of people you know, in Stockholm will be tourists walking up to this machine for the first time in their lives. And they need to get a ticket out of it, and everyone, every single one of them is going to, you know, fail and be frustrated and 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 fight with it and wait until a local explains it to them. Now it's a great chance for intercultural connections, but maybe we can still design, you know, machines like that in a little more useful way. Here's another example of, um, you know, cultural, um, you know, uh, peculiarities. While we uh, tend to think in the Western world that you know red is sort of stop or it's it's bad and green is go and and positive. Uh, this is how stock uh, numbers in 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 China are being displayed, and you can see here the red numbers are the ones that go up to the positive, right? This is a, a stock exchange um, display in China. Okay, so how do mappings and conceptual models play together? Well. To remember how mappings actually work, we tend to develop conceptual models, right? Uh, this is what's going on. So this is why mappings are easier for us to learn when the mappings between the controls and, and, the, and the results are actually understandable and are using these, these natural analogies, these spatial analogies, um, these cultural analogies, these biological analogies. And if a mapping isn't obvious, uh, then we need to build ourselves a little bit of a more conce complex conceptual model to understand how it works. Let's take this example. Uh, there is a, uh, an indicator uh, lever in your car, right? And to turn on your right indicator, you have to move the indicator up. And to turn on your left indicator, you have to uh, move the lever down. That is not a natural mapping, or is it? Why do you think it's designed that way? And why do you think it becomes easy to learn after just a short moment? Uh, yeah, Frederick, go ahead. It's basically the same direction as you would turn the steering wheel. Uh, Precisely, yeah. yeah, exactly. That, that, it, it's very simple, right? As you turn the wheel to go right, make a right turn, you basically can move the lever up as you do the turning of the wheel, right? It's the same movement. Uh, and that, that mapping uh, is immediately obvious. Once you've done it once, you, you're never going to wonder, OK, how do I need to flip the switch again? Um, so that's a good design, right? It wasn't obvious how to solve that problem at first. And maybe early cars had you know, a lot right and left shift lever or something. But once you integrate it into the steering wheel in this way, it's actually a great solution. Um, I think uh, Norman mentioned this in his book. There's a ex wonderful example for, uh, for bikes, for motorbikes that also have indicator lights. And when you get on a motorbike and you want to turn the indicator light on, then you have to push it forward to go right and to have to pull it towards you to go left. And that's because it's on the left-hand handle. Um, and as you make a right turn, again, you're moving the entire lever, the entire handlebar this way forward with the left hand. And that's why, you know, again, the movement, just like in the car, becomes natural. So these things, 
if we don't understand them immediately, once somebody explains them to you, or once you realize what the mapping, uh, you know, how the mapping is constructed, it often becomes very easy to remember. Well, and then sometimes, you know, you got mappings where I don't know what to say, right? This is just messed up. Uh, and every time every, anybody gets onto this elevator, they will probably have to find their own floor again. So as a result of this, this first part here, uh, we have a couple design principles. We now know that discoverability is super important in discovering state, uh, what's available, and what are the actions, and you know, how do I get to these other states. We have understood that a good conceptual model is critical. So we relate our own design model that we have in our head of how the interaction should work and how the system works through the system image, the user interface of a system. And the user then interacts with the system and thereby hopefully builds a mental model, uh, a conceptual model that is similar to what we have. And then finally, we talked about mappings here. Um, and we understand that good mappings um, are things like spatial analogies, or um, biological or cultural analogies. And they map between actions and results, between controls and their effects, or between a system state and its visualization. Uh, and then finally, uh, we know that uh, whenever something does happen, um, a result is, you know, some, some result is being achieved, then we need feedback. We need to put that information back into the user's um, perception. Uh, with vi visual or, or auditory so that they know what's going on. And ideally, that feedback should be continuous, you know, which is great with this car seat example. As soon as you push, your star seat starts moving. So even if you make a mistake, you immediately realize the mistake um, because you know, you're sitting in that seat and so you can feel the effects immediately. For constraints, constraints are the uh, sort of evil twin brother of affordances, you could say. They um, limit the ways in which you can use objects. So uh, you're providing cues uh, for what to do in certain situations, uh, especially in novel situations that people might not be uh, familiar with, by just ruling out a couple things that you know make sure the user cannot do. Um, a, a very simple example would be graying out menu items you know, that don't make sense. I can't print a document if I don't have a document open. Right? Um, the goals are, of course, again, avoiding mistakes people make uh, and also minimizing how much people need to remember. So by not showing things that you know uh, don't make sense anyway, or by graying them out or somehow making them inaccessible, we're just giving people an easier way to find the right path through the interaction. There's a whole bunch of difficult, dif different constraints. And as with um, the... Um, analogies um, and good mappings, uh, the first one is the most, you know, it's the easiest one to understand, physical constraints. And then there are a couple slightly more tricky ones uh, that we're going to talk about as well, semantic, logical, and cultural ones. Physical constraints are very simple. They just rely on physical properties like the shape, the size, or something like that of an object to constrain possible actions. So one example would be the size and shape of a traditional key, you know, a key that has this little, uh, you know, edge at the at the bottom with with little things sticking out, uh, the Bart as we say in German. Um, you know, that kind of key will never fit into a modern uh, security lock, right? We understand that. Um, or here, these two puzzle pieces. Um, of a, a picture that was probably taken more than three days ago of myself um, and that uh, somebody turned into a puzzle, uh, those two puzzle pieces don't fit together, right? We just see that this is not gonna be a fit because of the knobs on that, on that puzzle. Now, uh, these physical constraints can be highly visible and easy to detect ahead of time, and that's good, or they can be hard to detect. For example, um, a car key can be made to fit both ways, right? Um, and that's the best, <coughs> excuse me, that's the best way to design it because then I don't need to think about how I need to insert it, right? But I've, uh, I've had a car 
where you could actually sort of kind of slide in the car key in one direction into the lock, but it just wouldn't turn. You had to then actually take it back out, turn it around, and then it would actually work. Right? And that's the worst design, right? Where it does have that physical constraint, but it's not obvious immediately. Or um, can I say that I just, you know, I still want to kill the person who invented this USB. That is like the worst connector ever invented in history because have you ever tried to plug that in without you know being able to visibly see the slot clearly? And then you're like, all right, so it's this way. Oh no, it's the other way. Oh no, I just didn't catch. I've been fumbling around with these so many times. That is a terrible design, right? Because there is a constraint. It only fits one way, but it is super subtle. It's really hard to see. And if you can't actually see, because most, you know, oftentimes these connectors are not easily visible, you have to try and then it's just a hassle. So that's bad design. Um, if you take a look at you know, more modern connectors, you know, Lightning was the first one that, that sort of, you know, made this uh, widely available. That would just fit both ways, but it also works both ways. And nowadays we have USB-C, which also fits both ways and works both ways. And there's a whole lot of intricate you know, tech going on. If you ever want to be scared, then look up what's happening inside a USB-C USB plug when you plug it in one way or the other. There's all kinds of weird negotiation going on, what signal to put on what line as you do this. Uh, but it works, right? That's, that's the whole, most important point. Um, so <coughs> this is also a physical constraint. Um, one of our uh, heavies at the at the lab, a student assistant, um, was was running an experiment uh, because uh, he was doing a long term test of a of a Kinect camera back then overnight. They were trying a, ca a camera to run for a long time, um, and he needed to make sure that the light wasn't going to be turned off. So um, he didn't just put a, a, a label on the switch to say, "Don't turn this light off." But he also took a little bit of a metal, you know, frame bar uh, corner edge here, uh, and uh, put that, you know, glued that physically over the light switch so that it actually became impossible to just turn off that light switch, unless you know you lifted that frame and, and really fumbled. Uh, and that's a great example of a physical constraint. Physical constraints, like all constraints, make things harder, make certain things harder, right? And sometimes you do it because you'd never want this action to be done at all. And sometimes we do it because we want to really stop people from making that action, taking that action, um, you know, accidentally. Next up are semantic constraints. Those rely on our knowledge of the current situation. So physically, uh, there's nothing in the way of me doing something, but my knowledge, my, my understanding of the situation tells me that this is not what I should be doing, right? So for example, in a, in a model plane construction kit, I think this is an example that um, Norman mentions in its book, in his book, uh, in a model plane construction kit, uh, if there's a driver's figurine in there, there's only one meaningful location for that, you know, uh, pilot figurine, and it's all also one only one direction of that pilot because he wants to look forward and and be in the in the pilot seat, of course. Um, similarly, here on the right hand side, we now see two puzzle pieces that do fit together physically, but. Yeah, unless I had a terrible accent, that's probably not the way that this puzzle is supposed to go, right? Semantics, if you, know, you probably know this, but semantics in general means the, the study of meaning, right? So it's, it's uh, understanding what the meaning of, of something is. Um, but you got to be careful with this. You have to make sure that you use constraints, uh, semantic constraints that only make, that make sense for your user population, right? So. Uh, this is easily something that could break uh, across cultures, or sometimes it could even break um, uh, across time, right? So uh, we all know that there's still things like floppy disk icons on, on save buttons in applications uh, where I, I don't know, you know, whether you guys have ever held a floppy in, in your hands, right? So uh, these things stick around and then they become obsolete and they should no longer be used because the, the technology has, has moved on. Next up, logical constraints. Uh, in this case, we are relying not on our um, semantic understanding of the meaning of something, but really on pretty basic logical 
conclusions to constrain possible actions. For example, going back to that model uh, airplane kit, um, you probably want to end up having used all the parts in the construction kit, right? If something is left over, then you probably made a mistake. Um, or uh, performing a task in an obvious order, like one, two, three, is also a, a logical constraint. Or here we see this is probably not done because there is still one uh, puzzle piece missing in this piece. Oftentimes, and this is where mappings and constraints play together, oftentimes natural mappings employ these logical constraints. For example, if you have two switches for two lamps and the left switch is for the left lamp in the room and the right switch is for the right lamp, uh, then you could say that's a natural mapping from switch to, to lamp. But you could also say it's using a logical constraint, right? From looking at it uh, and, and making logical conclusions, uh, I would assume that one is uh, like, you know, is, is the left one and the other one is the right one. As you can also see, as soon as we move beyond physical constraints, um, they are not quite as hard anymore, right? They're not as un, you know, unavoidable, right? They can be overcome. Um, so they, the the most, the, the strongest ones are these are these physical constraints that really, um, you know, just physically make it impossible to do something. And finally, we've got cultural constraints. Um, cultural constraints rely on generally accepted cultural standards um, across a certain population to constrain the actions that you can do. Uh, they're like semantic constraints uh, in the way in that they change over time, right? Um, and examples are, uh, for example, labels. So labels are supposed to be read. Uh, and so you would expect them not to be upside down, right? So if I put, if I had a box, not the one that you're seeing here, but if I had a box that just said uh, fragile, right? Uh, and, and you can read this because it's, it happens to be your language and, and, and writing system, then uh, you would not under just understand that you have to be careful about this box, but you would also have a natural sense to know where up is probably you know, situated. Um, so labels already imply which side is up in the closed package, even if it doesn't say up or, or down on them. If, however, the labeling is in a writing system that you cannot read, um, then that doesn't quite work because you don't know whether the writing is upside down or not. But if it was labeled in French, even if you don't speak French, you recognize the letters. Um, if it's your writing system, then it still helps you to determine which side is up. Or, you know, red equals stop is another example of these cultural constraints that we often see uh, apply, applied. Um, and we just have to make sure that we um, understand that these are limited to, um, to a specific cultural group. You know, if that labeling on, on that box was only in, in, in Chinese, it would give most Westerners who can't read Chinese characters uh, no clue where up is. Um, and this is one of the root problems, these cultural uh, uh, peculiarities um, of universal design, right? Universal design meaning that you want to design for, for all users that are going to get in touch with your system. Uh, and this is really hard. So, uh, we can think about a couple uh, constraints, examples, maybe. So uh, I would like, maybe we can just have a couple of call outs here um, for examples of, uh, of constraints uh, for everyday objects. You know, you can think about things from your kitchen, but also security devices, vending machines, et cetera, that all employ uh, constraints. Physical ones are easy to find. The other ones are a little trickier to find. So any ideas, just raise your, uh, raise your hand and uh, we'll hear about them. Yeah, Henry, go ahead. Uh, the parking meters in most parking garages prevent you from putting money in with the physical uh, metal plate before you have uh, inserted your ticket. Ah, good one. Yeah, that's right. That's a physical constraint that is enforcing a certain order. Uh, in fact, that will we'll get back to the forcing functions in the next slide, and and you'll probably recognize that you could even look at it in, as a forcing function. But yeah, that's absolutely correct. Uh, share, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, of the shopping carts, there there is a place of the coin holder, and you can only mm -hmm. put your order to your coin side of that. 
cannot put any yes. that's a physical constraint that helps us uh, select the perfect coin of that shape yes exactly so only certain coins but then sometimes they actually you can slide in a different one but then it doesn't work and that's that's then of course a bad design if that is possible yes uh, uh shalish uh, shut doors essentially so i recently went to the university and uh, I could not enter through the door and it could only be opened from the inside. I could not even push or rotate the door handle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, that, so the door yep, itself so that, has been constrained. Okay, so the door is basically designed so that it can only be opened from one side in this yeah. case. Interesting. Yep. Okay, good. Uh, Janos. I was thinking uh, the like German insulated windows where you can uh, only rotate the handle to one side that allows you to either open it vertically or horizontally. But mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah, you can you can't really twist it the other way around. Um, or if it's like in the upright like locked position, you can only um, you can only twist it to open it. You don't have other yeah. options. Yeah, good example. Yeah, okay. So those those handles also, um, they they also actually fall into the, the some of the physical constraints we're talking about here will actually be uh, probably can be classified as forcing functions, which we'll talk about in just a minute. All right, we'll uh, we'll take one more, Felix. Felix N. Yeah. Can't hear you. Can't see you either, by the way. And what is about the drive system? Uh, I mean, the that you um, on the right side. It would ah, be okay. a cultural constraint, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, we could say that 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 uh, uh, many of the 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 rules um, of the of the driving system could be considered. Yeah. I would I would go as far as to say in a country where you have I mean the the, the fact that we drive on the right hand side um, is first of all is is sort of an arbitrary decision right so that that's by itself yeah. is not yet building on anything culturally established but once you have the right hand side driving in place for decades um, you could say that then other things following out of that like using that you could use that as a cultural constraint like we do on the on the traffic signs for example. Where we know that people understand that they're driving on the right hand side and that cultural constraint then sort of lets people make certain uh, understand certain other interfaces or certain other decisions uh, in, a, in, in that way. All right, uh, in the interest of time, we're going to move on. Um, sorry if we can't hear everybody. This is unfortunately um, a little bit of a time constraint uh, and a problem of the of the online format. Um, but you'll have more chances to to uh, talk about examples um, in in the lab as well. Uh, we wanted to do, forcing functions already came up. I mentioned it. Forcing functions are extreme versions of uh, physical constraints, and they help us to avoid errors. Um, they're well known. A forcing functions is a term that uh, comes from safety engineering, uh, where you make sure that certain things uh, don't happen, right? That certain people don't get themselves into dangerous situations. Um, the example you are seeing here is a is a, a a gate in front of a, a flight of steps, where as you're coming down in the, in the event of a fire, in the case of a fire, you're coming down to the ground floor of a building to exit it, and this next flight down uh, would lead into the basement, and so that you don't accidentally in your in your panic run down into the basement where you could get trapped. Um, this this gate is there so that you are like oh crap no I'm not supposed to go here I I need to exit the building now I'm at the ground floor it's very a fairly typical thing you will see in American um, buildings um, so these things are helping folks to you know not get hurt or not to do really bad uh, you know bad things that would would uh, lead to disastrous outcomes possibly but forcing functions in particular will usually always put some kind of burden on the normal operation. Uh, seat belts are an example. Like seat belts, uh, you could have an extreme forcing function where your car wouldn't even start if the seat back belt of the driver and anybody else who has a seat occupied wasn't buckled in. But that would be an extreme forcing function 
uh, that would then mean that you would always have to fasten the seatbelt before you leave, uh, before you drive. And while that makes sense for a lot of cases, um, I know a lot of taxi drivers, among taxi drivers in, in Germany who are all driving Mercedes cars, a lot of them, the most coveted um, replacement part is an extra seatbelt buckle. Why? Because they plug that, not for their own seat, they, they will fasten the seatbelt, they're not crazy, but they often have to transport things like they would put a heavy suitcase on their passenger seat, and then the Mercedes system would go off and start binging and making sounds. And if they have to drive 800 kilometers, you know, with, with that sound in their ears, because the, the car thinks that the passenger seat is occupied and isn't fastening the seatbelt, they go nuts. So they have this extra seatbelt thing in their, in their, in their, uh, you know, um, in their glove compartment. It will use that to quieten the alarm if it's going off. Uh, so that's an example of how people work around these things. Uh, forcing functions fall into different kinds. There is uh, the case of a lockout, which prevents an action to happen. The example of this stairway down to the basement is one. This is not there to sequence things, right? Not like uh, first go down to the ground floor and then go down to the basement. It's not doing anything like that. It's just keeping you from entering that possibly dangerous state of running into the basement without you really wanting to go there. Uh, Lock-ins, similarly, prevent you to prematurely leaving a state or stopping an action. For example, our modern computers all have soft power off switches, uh, which will then, you know, when you switch off your computer, ask you um, about saving certain files or maybe even do that automatically to avoid any data loss. So that soft switch locks you into the on state of your computer for a little while longer until it's safe to enter the off state. And then finally, interlocks, which we often see actually, for example, in kitchen appliances and, and, and safety uh, switches in, in, in um, workshops, uh, enforce a correct sequence. So you are basically uh, forced to do one thing first and then the other. Um, for example, it's really hard to expose yourself to microwave radiation from your microwave because um, your microwave will turn off when you open it. So that has an interlock built in where it's impossible to run it with the door open. Or I had a wonderful example uh, uh, that I once saw in a, in a bathroom stall at, a, uh, at an airport where when you, when you went into the bathroom stall um, and you closed the door, there was a little shelf that you could use to put stuff on. But you had to fold that shelf down. It was up against the wall. So you folded it down. And you put your stuff there, like maybe your handbag or something, right? Uh, and then you went about your business. And when you're done, ready to leave the stall, you couldn't open the door because the folded down shelf was physically blocking the door to open. You had to fold the shelf back up in order to open the bathroom stall. Why? Because by folding it up, by forcing you to fold it up, you, the system made sure that you would take your stuff and not leave anything behind. So many people would leave stuff on that shelf and then leave the bathroom stall and, and then had to retrieve it later on. It would, might even be considered a security hazard these days. So this was a system that was interlocking you. You had to fold that thing back up before you could open the door to enforce you to empty that shelf and take your stuff with you. All right, so that's constraints and uh, you know the evil twin brother of affordances. And they're even worse, you know, bullying, bullying brute of a, of a relative, the forcing functions, right? Now we get to the seven stages of action. And, and this is a model uh, that helps us fundamentally understand how people do things, um, how they make a plan of what they want to do and how they execute that plan in order to achieve uh, something in the world. And I'm not talking about, you know, finishing your degree or anything that grand. I'm talking about very small things like turning on a light. That's, uh, that's the kinds of goals that we're talking about here in the seven stages of action. And just like with everything else, we're not learning these models just because they're models to be learned. We're learning them because we can use them to understand when things go wrong, to have a, a vocabulary to talk about these usage failures that can happen, these fail, failure points, and how to detect them and possibly correct them in, a, in an interface design. From a very basic standpoint, 
the seven stages of action are actually super simple. Um, the model says, and, and again, there's uh, a couple of pages in Norman's book about this. The model says that you start out with a goal that you have in, in, in mind, like turning on the light. Um, then you execute that goal. You flick that switch. This changes the world. Um, light turns on. Then you evaluate your outcome. You look at whether it's now bright enough to read. Uh, and you go back and check whether your goal has been fulfilled. Are you happy? Can you now start reading? Yes or no? Super easy, right? So in its most basic part, uh, apart from, you know, from your goal, you ex execute an action and then you evaluate the results on, on, on the return path, so to say. And the seven stages of action models exactly this kind of activity, right? Um, coming up with a goal, executing, and checking whether it was successful comparing to your intended state that you wanted to get to. Now let's zoom in uh, to each of these two sides in a little more detail. First of all, the execution. The execution starts with this goal, um, and then it unrolls into three separate steps that are being done in sequence. They are like refinement steps of getting from your goal to actually changing the world, which sounds very grand, but I'm just talking about flicking a light switch, right? Turning on a light. Um, the first thing you do is from the goal that you had, you're gonna make a plan on how you can achieve that goal. Uh, you then specify an action sequence and then you perform that action sequence. Let's first, let's look at each of these in, in more detail. The goal formulation um, is often very vague uh, and problem oriented. Like you might be sitting there trying to read and you might think, oh, I need more light, right? I need more light is not something that you can act on yet, right? There's not, there's no, that's not a solution. It's, it's problem oriented. So we need to then translate this into a, a plan that is oriented towards achieving that goal. For example, well, operate that light switch over there. Now we've got a plan on what you want to do, but it's, it's not something you could feed a robot yet, right? You could maybe feed it into a robot if the robot knew what a light switch was and, and could scan its environment and find it and then plan a, a movement path. But I'm talking about a really dumb robot, right? Industrial robot that you know welds cars together. That kind of robot would need more detailed description. And so does your own body. Um, because you need to translate that uh, plan into an, a, correct, a concrete action sequence um, that is like, okay, turn around, stretch out your arm, and put the finger on the switch and press. Okay. So you see how we are getting from a problem-oriented goal over via a, a plan that is a little bit you know, more solution-oriented, but not mechanically complete yet, so to say, to a concrete action sequence that is kind of like, you know, that could drive a robot. And also note that already there are alternative plans that we could formulate and all alternative action sequences we could take for the same goal. For example, um, instead of operate the light switch, my plan could instead say, I could ask you know, my friend who's sitting in the same room as I am to operate that light switch for me because maybe he's closer to it, right? That would be a solution. And then my action sequence would look differently. Or I could plan to operate the light switch, but I could actually come up with different ways of doing it. Maybe I don't need to stretch up my arm. Maybe I can use, you know, a long pencil or screwdriver or something and, and uh, operate the switch without uh, by doing that. Um, so there's always alternatives here. Now, next, let's zoom into the right-hand side of this model, right? The evaluation side. The evaluation side is the one where we first perceive the state of the world. We, we look at what happened or we hear the result, you know, depending on which, which uh, modality we, we use to, uh, to uh, see what happened. Sometimes we feel something when a, a lock clicks into place, for example. Then we interpret what we just perceived um, so we make sense of what we saw. And then once we've made sense of that, we know what that 
perception meant to us, uh, we can compare it to our goal that we originally had. So did we actually reach it? And if we take those three things on the evaluation side and the three expanded things on the execution side, we end up with the seven stages of action model. So as you can see here, it moves from a goal to a to planning, specifying, and performing the action, which is the execution side of things. That then has an impact on the environment around us and the world. And then we perceive the results, we interpret them, and we compare them. So um, we need to think about a few uh, a few details here. Um, because this is this is of course again this is not how the brain really really works on a on a you know neural basis, but it's good enough for us to make to derive a couple um, guidelines from it. But the the model is is very simplistic. First of all, uh, those steps I'm talking about are not easy to distinguish, right? Uh, in reality, in reality, we, these things happen. We go back and forth between steps and. Um, this can easily lead to, for example, for any anything that is more complex than what I just described with the light switch, for example, will typically lead to uh, hierarchies of goals and subsequences. Um, because, for example, if I might say um, I want to, you know, read this book, then I, there's a couple of things I need to do, such as um, turn on the light, find the book in the shelf, and um, and find a good place to sit and 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 read it. So there's a lot of different things we are doing uh, that all belong together um as a as a as a how should i say as a as a larger goal and then uh, we don't always complete these these things right we goals can get forgotten they can get discarded uh or they can get changed right so um we don't always act on these uh, in a complete cycle also a lot of actions are opportunistic uh for example you might, you know, run into uh, a friend uh, in the hallway between two classes, and that reminds you, oh, yeah, we wanted to, you know, agree on a time tonight to meet up to work on that assignment, right? So in this case, you didn't start out with need to agree on a time with for the assignment with friend, but, you know, it started with you perceiving your friend coming down the hallway, recognizing him, and then saying, oh, that was something I needed to do. Um, also, deadlines, for example, you know, we all love deadlines, um, are often, um, you know, things that push us towards doing certain things um, and, and getting us to set up our, our own goals and working on them. So we could say that these cycles, these, these goal um, world cycles, um, are driven by, uh, you know, by the goal itself, or they can be driven by the world or event driven, as, as Norman calls it. Right? Okay, so having understood that, that this model you know, gives us uh, a basic understanding of how people interact with their environment, uh, we're now going to take a look at how things can go wrong and how we can design interfaces to avoid things going wrong. And for this, let me introduce the concept of gulfs. A gulf, you know, is, is like a, a chasm, an abyss, a, a break in the ground. Um, these gulfs are breaking points that can happen on our way around this seven stages of action model. And the model helps us as designers understand where things could break down and thereby, you know, design new interfaces and interactions by rethinking um, existing gulfs. So this can lead to, to, to innovative uh, designs. First of all, there is a gulf of execution, or there are several gulfs of execution, I should say, which means from the goal to the world, when we're trying to decide how are we going to do this, uh, how are we going to operate this device, there can be failure points. And then there is a whole class of gulfs of evaluation in which we are failing to interpret the results or perceive um, the, the results of an, out, uh, of a, of an action um, so that we can compare them to our original goal. 
And the role of us as designers is essentially to help bridge these gulfs with our interface. How do we bridge gulfs of execution? We're gonna see some examples in a second, but in, in, in principle, we bridge these gulfs of execution by introducing good signifiers, constraints, mappings, conceptual models, and so on. And, um, so all the things we've talked about in, in this respect help us, help the users get from a, a goal in their head to the action sequence they need to perform. For example, a well-designed pen, if my goal is to write something down and I see a well-designed pen that's clear to how to operate, et cetera, it helps me to get to the correct action sequence for writing down what I wanted to write down. The Gulf of Affiliation, on the other, on the other hand, is um, something that will rely on good feedback of the system and also good conceptual models, just like the Gulf of Execution. In both cases, conceptual models influence the whole uh, cycle of, this, uh, of these seven stages. Let me give you a couple examples. First of all, for the Gulf of Execution, even very simple actions can seem very, you know, can, can become difficult. Um, one reason why that could be is because you cannot see how the system works or what to do. You know, if I pick up this peanut bag, I know I want the peanuts, right? I want this bag open, but the bag in this case doesn't give me any clue on how or where to open it. Uh, you know, if I'm not getting out the scissors or knife. So that is a bad design because I'm missing the affordances and signifiers telling me how to open this bag and where to open it. So in this case, I'm failing very early on because I know I'm hungry, you know, goal oriented. My plan is have some peanuts, open the bag and, and eat them. Uh, but I'm failing to even turn that plan into any kind of action sequence, right? I don't know how to do that. And the problem, of course, again, affordances, mappings, signifiers. <coughs> Next up, um, I could also fail um, when I have a peanut bag, and you've probably been, been in that situation, you have a peanut bag uh, that looks like it's it has a red marker where you're supposed to pull it open, and then you pull on that, and then after like two centimeters, that red tab just tears off. I've done that like a million times with Amazon packages, right? You know, you, you, there's like this clearly marked thing where you're supposed to open it. You try that, and then it just rips off. In that case, what's happening is not that I didn't fail to come up with a plan and an action sequence to execute but the actual execution of it actually failed, right? I wasn't able to complete it in the way that I thought I could complete it. Now, what this shows us is that the gulf of execution opens up through differences between what the user is planning as actions and the actions that the system offers, which is actually affordances, if you think about it, right? Every object suggests to us, we learned this when we talked about affordances, suggests to us certain actions we can do with it. And if those actions don't map, don't match somehow what we plan to do, what our plan content contains, then eh, we, we can't move forward. An ideal system then lets the user execute the planned actions directly without any extra effort, right? That's how you want it. You have a plan to open that bag of peanuts. It's got a clearly marked, you know, tear here thing, and you do the movement that the arrow suggests, and it just opens up. That's how you want it. Now, moving a little beyond um, peanut bags, I want to show you an example um, of a Bluetooth headset. Uh, this Bluetooth headset is is uh, fantastic when you think about affordances, signifiers, and I, 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 it scores really badly in pretty much all the departments here. But let me explain to you what you can do with this headset. Um, this headset has two buttons for the volume. Okay. And then it has one other button. And that button is called mode. And um, anytime you see a button called mode, I would also consider that a warning label. It's kind of like, you know, those industrial design awards. Um, the mode button is tricky, we will we'll still get to that when we talk about errors, because modes can introduce a whole own class of errors. 
But in this case, this button, let me tell you what it did. And I need to look at the instructions here because this is impossible to remember. Um, depending on what state the headset is in, and also depending on how long you press that button, there's your time-based interface, um, this button will do the following. Turn on the device, turn it off, start pairing it, start voice uh, dialing, so you can speak something to, to dial. It can also start doing a repeat call, so repeat the last number dialed. It can cancel a dialing pro uh, um, sequence. And, and here's my favorite two ones. It can be used to accept a call or to reject a call. And you can also hang up with it, all using the same button. So, but hey, it's super easy to use, right? Because uh, some of these modes are actually indicated by certain blinking patterns off the two LEDs on the device, which is great because it's a device I have in my ear and I can't see those LEDs, right? Can I? So I don't know what they were thinking, right? This is a wonderful example. Uh, visibility completely tanked with this design, right? Obviously, but also note that there are lots of gulfs of execution that this opens up, right? I pick this thing up. First time I pick it up, I'm like, okay, I would like to do Bluetooth. I, I need to turn this on. Well, there's no on button. Right? The only button I find is a mode button and two volume buttons. So I don't know, do I need to press that or a sequence or need to hold it for a longer time or short? I don't know. Um, then I need to pair it. How do I do that? I don't know, right? So all of these things basically mean if you ever lose the manual for this thing and you don't find it online, you can basically toss this into the bin, right? Because you're not going to be able to reconstruct how this thing works. So lots of gulfs of, evil, uh, of execution here um, to get from your plans for different actions uh, for goals that you have to the actual action sequences. Now onto the gulf of evaluation. Um, what that means is the gulf of evaluation basically tells you that it's often unclear what an action, uh, what effect an action had or whether it was successful at all. And the problem, of course, with, uh, with this is missing feedback. An ideal system will tell you what the state is, the system is in at any time. Um, and that display of the current state will, easy to be, will be easy for you to interpret um, and will match your conceptual model that you have of your system. But the reality is often different, right? We've all stood in front of a printer and the printer it's, you know, it's a budget model, so it couldn't afford a fancy display, but it has a blinking LED. And so I send a page of, you know, stuff to, to print to it. Um, and I walk over to the printer and it's blinking. Now, what does that mean? It could mean that the printer is still busy, you know, preparing my page to print because it's a budget printer. It's going to take some time. Um, it could also mean that it's out of paper and it's waiting for me to refill the paper tray. Or the LED could mean that it completely crashed or you know that it needs a firmware update, I don't know. So the blinking LED, I can clearly with my eye, I can clearly perceive that the LED is you know, on, off, on. Off. So I don't have, a trouble, have trouble with perceiving the feedback. I can see it. That's the difference between these lower two levels on the, on the side of the evaluation. Perception, no problem. Interpretation is the problem. I can't make out the semantics of the signal that I'm perceiving. Now, if on the other hand, the LED was so dim and I was in a you know, room where the sunlight hits the printer and I can't even see whether the LED is on or off or blinking, then I have a problem of perception. Another example I wanna give you is uh, uh, the game Mist. Now that just got re-released, I think. Uh, so maybe you've heard about it. It's a game where you're basically stranded on an island and uh, you know it's a puzzler, right? So you need to figure out how to operate. There is weird mechanical contraptions on that island that you need to operate. And so for example, you will walk up to you know, um, a lever on the wall in a, in a little hut and you will flick that lever. And then on the other side of the island, 
a door opens because of you, you know, you, you switch that lever. Um, so in the game, this is fun, right? This is what makes the game fun to figure out these completely crazy mappings between input and, and result. But I don't want my real life to become a misadventure game, right? In real life, I don't want to sit there scratching my head about like, okay, so if, when I do this, what is going to happen? Right? So everyday things shouldn't be as challenging uh, as that. But also, it's uh, as a side note, just here, games are an incredibly interesting uh, domain for HCI because a lot of things, you know, games often have to make things difficult they I, they always have to because otherwise there's no challenge right and without the challenge the game is usually no fun um and so they need to carefully balance that challenge and they and these you know intended difficulties of of interaction if you like the intended hurdles to reach a goal are there to 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 challenge you and to be fun to to overcome but of course, a game that you know has a has a menu screen where you pick you know how many players you want to be, and that kind of selection is more difficult than it should be. That's bad interface design, right? That can't be excused with "Hey, it's a game." Okay, so that's the uh, that's the seven stages of action. Um, we should remember first of all the 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 default way of running this model is you start with a goal. You that is problem oriented, like I need more light. Um, you have a plan to turn on the light switch, you specify it out into a sequence of actions, like you know, turn around, flip that switch, and you perform it. You actually do the movement on each of these steps from goal to plan, from plan to specification of the action sequence, and to performing the actual action sequence. You can have gulfs where that fails, okay, and affordances, mappings, uh, uh. You know, signifiers, constraints, all these things uh, play a role in helping you as a designer uh, to design in, in a system where the user doesn't fall into these gulfs. Then once the action has been done, there is a feedback up the uh, up this in this model where the user perceives the action's result, needs to interpret it, understand what it means, and then map it to what they were trying to do in the first place. And again, on each of these levels, you can have failure points. Um, now, one thing that is easy to get wrong here in this example is to uh, that people may have the wrong goal, right? For example, um, let's say you're sending a, a, a document to the printer, and once you pick it up, you realize, oh, I printed the wrong document. Now, the, the print a document, print a document seven stages of action model was completed perfectly fine here, right? I got from the goal to print the document uh, to, to doing that. And when I walk up to the printer and find it's the wrong document, then something went wrong, but on a higher level, right? I picked the wrong document to print in the first place. Uh, so that's something that you need to be aware of. Also, oftentimes you will find that in practice, um, you may have a very abstract goal um, and as part of your plan, you then find, oh, I need to flesh that out more. There is a more detailed sub-goal sequence that I need to formulate out um, in order to actually complete the larger goal. For example, um, if you wanted to play a piece of music on, on uh, let's say, uh, on your computer, then you know uh, there's the first subtask of firing up your computer, and then maybe the second subtask, then once that's been done successfully, could be um, finding and launching the, the music app and then finding the right song and, and starting that. And each of these things will in turn then have sub goals like where you need to, I don't know, uh, find an, an application icon on a, in, in a bin window full of application icons and scroll and set, et cetera. So in reality, these things are highly nested um, and uh, can work at multiple different levels. Now, what can, what can we do with the seven stages of action? Uh, the seven stages of action can actually work as a design guideline. Now, let me show you a, a basic checklist of, of questions that you could ask yourself. Uh, and maybe we can run through this with an example here. Um, first of all, let's say the, um, we, we, have a, we have that simple goal 
of the um, of the light switch that we talked about. Um, the first question, of course, is um, what's the goal? What do I want to accomplish as as a user? Um, all right, I need I need more light. Uh, what are the alternative action sequences? So it helps as a designer to think about maybe not just one way that the user will want to uh, arrive at that goal, but consider that users may formulate different goals based on you know their background, the context they're in, uh, the details of the goal, uh, how you know what 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 kind of facet they are interested in. So there may be multiple ways that uh, you know different plans that people come up with. Which ones do you want to support in the interface? Which ones can your interface support? Next up, then, users are going to formulate an action sequence. right? And for that, um, they need to first understand what actions are available. Remember the Swedish hairdryer, where we weren't even sure whether it had two levels of power. So um, I don't know if I, my goal is to quickly dry you know, my sweater that, I, that got wet in the rain. Then can I set this thing to, to ultra hot? Or can I not, right? If the interface doesn't show that by displaying through affordances and signifiers what actions are available and how to get to them, then I can't specify that kind of action sequence with confidence. The next up is how do I do that? Um, so if I know, for example, again, you know, hair dryer example, I want to uh, dry my sweater with, with full power on. Uh, I now know that this thing has two lever levels. How do I get to level two, right? How do I do that? And then, of course, I turn on the, uh, the hairdryer and, and hopefully I get by the sense of airflow and, and heat that it, it's at full power, right? I can sense the differences between level one and two. So that should be pretty easy. But, you know, if it is, if you're in one room and uh, you're controlling just the switch and the, 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 the blower is actually in the next room with a real long cable in between, and you need to just go by, by the switches, position and you don't get the feedback from the machine itself, then you want actually a clearly labeled switch that tells you which level you're at and, and what you just did to the machine. Um, we need to, when we, when we perform that and we perceive what, what just happened, we need to just be able to see it, but we also need to make sense of that, right? So the, the, the famous blinking LED of interfaces that's often used in, in budget device design where it's just cheaper to put an LED on than, than even the, the, the simplest of displays, um, that's often super critical, right? Because an LED is, has so little that it can say, I think the only thing that everybody will always understand without any manual is that an LED is on if the device is on, an LED is off if the device is off. Everything that goes beyond that makes it tricky. So at the very least, you will need some labeling next to the LEDs. You often see that, you know, check out your, your router that you have, you know, your Fritz box or whatever you have in your home. Um, it's got a bunch of LEDs, but each of them has a little label next to it that tries to explain to you what that LED means. Now, this is not ideal design, clearly, because we need labels to explain the interface, right? But um, it's better than LEDs without labels, where you just have to pull out the manual every single time. But you'll often probably find that, yeah, it says something like cable next to it. But what does that really mean? Does that mean my cable is plugged in, or does it mean I my cable company has is sending me a, a data signal? I, I don't know, right? And then of course the 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 better design we often see that actually reason uh, in recent times more so uh, is just to put a display on the thing, because an actual pixel display uh, that can render out clear text instructions, feedback in in multiple languages. Um, you know, with, with, with the choice of languages available is so much more informative um, than what you can show with, a, you know, a single LED light or two. Um, and a, a similar example is uh, voice interfaces, right? Um, uh, we now increasingly see even simple consumer devices being equipped with actual voice feedback uh, where you're like, why, why did they put a voice feedback in there? But, you know, it often makes sense. I mean, I have a, I have a, cleaning robot, like your vacuuming robot that, ha that has voice feedback. You would think that's not necessary for something as simple as a robot, but if it fails, all it can do is blink a little light at me, and then the voice actually explains to me what's going on. And I guess the, you know, uh, a speaker was cheaper to put in there than having a display. Um, 
So we need to make sense of that, that feedback. We need to interpret it. And then finally, users need to understand, have I actually accomplished my goal? Have I, have I reached what I was set out to do? And this is not always easy. Um, I don't know about you, but whenever I send something to a printer from my laptop, I'm always a little nervous to know exactly when it's safe to you know, shut down the laptop. Has that print job really already made it over to the printer? Is it going to do it or do I need to turn it, leave it on? You know what I'm talking about, right? So these are these little insecurities. Um, and, and one thing I want to leave you with for today um, is something that um, took me a long time to learn, but it's really probably if you're looking for just one way to formulate how good interfaces should work, um, it, it's really sort of the ultimate truth in a way. Um, Whatever people do with technology, um, they always want to feel competent. I mentioned this before, but I, I want to reiterate this. Um, because what that means is that when you use tech, when you interact with any kind of device, whatever, alone or in company with, with others, um, you always want it, you want to feel competent for yourself. You know, you don't want to feel like you're wasting time struggling with a printer or something but you also want to feel competent in front of your friends, your colleagues, your coworkers, your family, whatever. Um, so, um, you know, a device that makes you look incompetent in front of others is not doing a good job, right? Um, and uh, not letting people feel competent when using technology is often a trigger for them not enjoying using the device, making mistakes, not really wanting to, you know, continue to use that device, getting something else next time they have a chance complaining about the software, um, having trouble with it. So keep that in mind. Um, technology should make people feel competent and not incompetent. So struggling with tech in front of others, whether it's pushing a button that's too small for your finger to reach comfortably or um, not being able to see that LED light on your printer when you want to tell your friend whether your printout is working or not, all those things are not necessary. They should not be happening if you want people to feel competent using tech. All right, with the seven stages of action, we can wrap this up for today. Each of these stages um, requires its own design strategies, right? Um, and we will talk more about design strategies in the upcoming weeks. Um, but in summary, we can say um, you've learned for today, you've learned about mappings, spatial, perceptual, biological, and cultural analogies. Um, We've talked about constraints, physical ones, which were, um, you know, uh, especially uh, forcing functions, uh, but also semantic, logical, and cultural constraints. And you've seen the seven stages of action. The engineering model, um, it, it is an engineering model, um, the seven stages of action, just like, um, you know, the CMN model we talked about or Fitz Law and these kinds of things. Um, we've talked about the gulfs in execution and evaluation that we want to um, overcome, that we want to help the user not to fall into. Um, and this simple sequence from forming a goal to a plan, to specifying an action sequence, to performing it, to perceiving it, interpreting what we see uh, or hear, and then comparing it to what we had is sort of the, the fundamental sequence that's happening at all kinds of levels um, all the time when we interact with our environment. So the only thing I'm left with for today is to remind you um, to continue reading Norman's book, Design of Everyday Things. Um, right around page 122 should be um, your next uh, you know, uh, stage goal to do this. But we won't be spending much longer on this book. I think next week is the last week that we spend on materials from that. Is that right, Oli? All right, yes. Yeah. OK. So with that, I'll leave you to it. Um, enjoy the rest of your day today and hope to see you all back again next week. Thank you. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.